Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. So we're back with Wombats and we're here for something a bit different. We're going to talk about, I don't know how we're going to title this yet, but you'll know <laughs> on the thumbnail, uh, pilot chat, uh, cockpit talk, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, Wombat, can you tell us about this and how do you start even training for it? Uh, well, at first, thanks for having me back on. It's awesome to be back. Um, yeah, so it's it's pretty simple and I think it's a, a pretty good secret that we're going to give out here, but at least in the U.S., all we did uh, is they they would send us now this is a long time ago right so it was a VHS tape of the original Top Gun movie we just watched that about 500 times and you had all the lingo down you knew how to talk and it was that simple and then you just went on and flew so, <laughs> if only it was that easy um, it, you know it's it's funny because one of the comments we get a lot you know from these interviews and even in the book and things like that is you know you have to be real careful with um, with the acronyms and all that because you know you're I'm it's a language to me. And, and the more you're around it, the more it becomes a language. And but to the reader or to the listener, it's like, wait, what? And it distracts so much from it. So there's parts like, in, in fact, in the book and on the audio version where, it, in my opinion, it takes away when the when the narrator reads, because I'll, I'll explain what an acronym is the first time. Um, to me, it takes away from the story. Right. Because I know what the acronym is. So I want to keep moving. But for the reader, they don't know. And if I don't explain it now, they're like, well, what does that mean? And I've seen other authors do it where they um, they they put like a list at the back of the book. Yeah. And I'm like, I never like that either, because then it's like, well, I have to stop and, and all this. Yeah, so yeah. it really is an art form. Um, but it, it, it there's no formal training. There's no I don't ever remember. Now, I went through um, uh, Air Force primary training, like we've talked about before, flying the T-37 and and. Um, obviously different from the Navy. So six weeks of Navy training in ground school where I started picking up on these things. I mean, even the training av aviation preflight indoctrination was just referred to as API. And for the longest time, I'm like, I don't even know what API means, you know, <laughs> and I'm in the, and I'm in the training. Yeah. So you would learn a little bit in that six weeks and then off to air force school where they teach a whole different set. I mean, there's some things that bleed over, but like the landing pattern is a different thing in the air force than the Navy. Uh, the overhead, the break is a different thing in the air force and the Navy. And you could see it, um, when you talk or you watch, uh, or listen to, you know, guys like mover talking and stuff, he'll say things that, like, for instance, he'll, he won't say the term box because in the Air Force, they don't say they don't say box. And I'm like, that's stupid. Like we say box all the time. So there's little nuances, even in the language from one uh, service to the other. And I'm sure it is in every country that way. So um, it really just takes time. And it's probably one of the one of the hardest things to to really pick up on because it's just below the surface, right? I mean, the aviation stuff is easy. You know, you have to study that, right? You know that when you pull back on the stick, the house just gets smaller. When you push over, they get bigger. You know your instruments, you know you need to learn that. But if you can't communicate with the instructor and he's trying to tell you something or she's trying to tell you something and it's like, I don't even understand what you're saying. So it's, it's a two-sided street because on the one hand, as the student, you're kind of expected to pick up on this stuff. But then when I went on further in my career and became an instructor, the onus is also on the instructor to be able to create a message that the, you know, the recipient can get. And, and even in my civilian life now, uh, I've worked with people, mentored new instructors, and, and some of these guys and girls are, well, most of them are far smarter than I'll ever be. Um, you know, and I'll tell them that. I go, look, you are an Einstein when it comes to this subject matter. I go, but you can't get the message across. So your goal as an instructor is to take that message and that language and present it to the to the audience. And that's a that's a really tricky thing. And I think that does separate kind of a good from a great instructor is that ability. So a lot of it's hands on. There's really no 
I mean, I'm sure at Vance there was there was like a glossary <laughs> where you could go and look stuff up, but it wasn't really as formal as you would expect. Um, it just comes with time and repetition and uh, and just just listening and trying to piece it all together. And a lot of times you think you know what something means, so you're like, oh yeah, I got it, and you don't, but you think you do, and that's good enough to get you through the flight, and then you'll learn later. So it, it definitely takes some time for sure. So it's certainly learning on the job, as it were. But what happens if, um, you know, you're supposed to pick it up? But let's take an e- easy one, RTB. Are you, and if you don't know, do you go, what does that mean? Or do you just say, got it, and then you just find it up somewhere? Do you have, uh, is there note cards or anything like that? Nothing flying, necessarily, um, because you're so engrossed in what you're doing, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, so like, like a return to base like that or, you know... It, that's a great example where in the plane that could be an issue, right? It's like, all right, let's RTB. And you're like, well, is that a loop? Like, what do you want me to do? I got to, you know, and a lot of times it's funny. Um, now I never taught at the basic level, uh, but I have friends that did. I was an intermediate instructor in the Navy. And, and most of the time by then the students have at least a working knowledge. Now where I would see it was when we would take them to the boat, because that's a whole different animal of lingo mm-hmm. and going to the ship and landing on a carrier. But my buddies that taught in primary, they would laugh at the, the stories back and forth. You know, you, an example like that's like, all right, let's RTB. And, and the student starts to do a maneuver and you're like, what are you doing? And he's like, I thought you wanted this. And it's like, no, I want to. We're low on gas. Like, we got to go back. So it's sometimes it's your own. You're just kind of own not lack of knowledge as an as a student pilot that you do something dumb and then guess what rtb is going to stick in your brain for the rest of your career because you gooned it up and now you know it's there and it's a lot of that um you know throughout all the acronyms and and things like that so it really does and then you get older like me and you forget what half of them are because you've gotten more acronyms shoved in your your head from other parts of your career and it just there's times where somebody will say something and i'm like I need to look that up. It's been a while. So, you know, it's just, it's what you're used to and what you're around really, but no flashcards, nothing like that. There's no room, at least to me, <laughs> I, was, I was, it was too small. I was in my world and that was it. So, um, but yeah, I was, it was challenging for sure. Yeah. So going through your experience, obviously, uh, on the E2 and then the Hornet, was there a different language set there or was it generally the same? Um, as a general kind of umbrella, naval aviation is the same, especially carrier aviation. Um, you know, so taking out the P3s and the P8s and stuff like that. But and 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 to some respect, the Helos because they have their own language as well. But carrier aviation, you know, there was kind of an overarching umbrella because that's how you spoke around the ship. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, now there were terms that maybe we used more in the Hornet because of the mission than we did in the Hawkeye. Um, but for the most part, you know, your, your different things about operating around the ship and operating in that environment have to be the same because everybody has to be on the same page and and all that. So it really did kind of, that was one thing that did, um, kind of transfer pretty easily with the transition. And then on top of it, having been an LSO, uh, which is a great acronym landing signals officer, um, having done that, there was even more that I had brought with me. So, um, so that definitely helped a lot, but there are some nuances. There's definitely some tactical things in the Hornet that, you know, while I may have listened to them doing their control on the radio, I never really picked up on what some of that did, you know, mm-hmm. meant I just kind of listened and thought it mm-hmm. sounded cool. So <laughs> figured I'd go fly that plane. Yeah. <laughs> Before we move on to a few points here, one but uh, so obviously, uh, you will carry a base to, uh, when you went into, you know, a brief or debrief and you were talking to non-air crew, would you again speak in that pilot talk or would you have to not even coach dumb it down for them um well that's a good question so obviously as pilots we think we're the smartest people in every room right so everybody needs to conform to us Mm -hmm. um so for the most part i think and again uh, naval aviation is very unique in the sense that you know we take our whole package with us and go right so it's our whole world is on that ship um i think for the most part we did not change how we spoke. We spoke and everybody kind of adapted around us, which that's not to say that's the best way to do it. That's just the way it was. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, when we would debrief uh, the intelligence officers or we would talk to the, the, as we joke, the weather guessers and stuff like that, we would always just kind of talk. And then they, I think being around that so much picked up on it 
where it applied to their job. You know, if we're talking a target area or something like that, you could speak in acronyms to somebody that's looking at the weather because they're used to it. Once they hear it a few times, they're like, oh, okay, now I know what he Got means. It. It's probably part of their training. Intel is the same way. Um, you know, you'd give an Intel brief and it would take me four times as long if I had to explain everything I was saying. But if it's just a data dump of, hey, we just did this, we hit this target, we went here, this is what our goal was. All right, questions, nope. All right, here's the battle damage assessment. See ya, mm -hmm. and we're done. So, and frankly, because they were so busy, it behooved them to learn how to listen to that because, you know, every hour you're landing, you know, upwards of a dozen planes that they have to get debriefs from each one. So it just happens so quickly that, that they would rather probably conform to us and just be like, all right, I know what these guys are saying. We can just, mm -hmm. we can move on. So that's typically how it worked. Um, I can't speak for the air force. I would imagine it's the same way only because you're just immersed in that environment. The only thing I could see a little bit different in the air force is just cause it's a little bit bigger organization and there's more uh, outside sources that come yeah. in. Uh, whereas for us, it was, you know, the carrier was the world, basically. So, yeah, and that was it. And obviously, I'm guessing you've worked with other nations as well. And how does that work? Obviously, because I'm guessing, obviously, different nations have different uh, talk. On a safety level, was that never scary? Or did you just, again, just, <laughs> I kind of understand what you mean. Get on with it. It was uh, very scary at times. So uh, I remember even which you'll laugh at the first time we spoke, I talked to my wife beforehand and, and we had listened to some of the interviews you had done. And, and she's like, yeah, he sounds like a great guy. I'm like, yeah, he sounds awesome. I just hope I can understand everything he's saying from his <laughs> accent. And she's like, really? And I'm like, well, when you get into a conversation, you can miss nuances. It's very course, easy. Yeah. And I mean, we essentially speak the same language, which is fine. Yes. So yes, when we would, uh, you know, work with these other nations and things like that, that was probably the single biggest source of briefing was making sure we were on the same page because you mm -hmm. don't have that natural ability to just spit out something to your wingman or to your crew or something that you know they're going to understand on the first chance. Because yeah. in aviation, I don't care if you're flying a, a Cessna all the way up to the coolest, most tactical, God knows what generation fighter we're on these days. Sometimes you have to say something now and it has to happen now or else it's catastrophic uh, consequences. So you know, we would do things with the Indian Navy. We would work even with the I mean, this sounds crazy, but even the Canadians and things like that, the Australians. And I mean, you're talking about people that speak the same language in a lot of respects, but it was so different and their nuances and their words. So we spent a lot of time when we would do that. Um, just going over the basics, you know, where are you going to be in the sky? How are we going to fly this formation? How are we going to intercept each other with this training? Things like that. And then on top of it, you're also trying not to give away anything classified. So now you're, you know, whereas when we work in that, that organization in the Navy, everybody knows everybody's security clearances. You can just go nuts. You know what you can say. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's like, well, am I even allowed to say that? Can I even use that system? Like oh, it was so much more intense, mm -hmm. um, just preparation and things like that, that it was fun, but it was definitely, uh, challenging for sure. And I'm guessing you probably had it, uh, having, the other pilots uh whatever the other aircraft to repeat something or them asking you to repeat something did that get on your nerves and be like yes i just i just said it yeah it does um to the point where there's even there's terms uh like one of the terms is judy where it's like just shut up i don't want to hear anymore you're talking too much <laughs> yeah. um there's things like that because because yeah it does it gets frustrating where you're trying to get a message across and if you're in a um a a tough environment, you know, where it's combat or even even training, because I mean, we trained to fight. That's what we did. Took it very seriously. Uh, you end up in a situation where it's like, like, I need you to hear it on the first time. And if you can't, you, you know, it's not helping me. And, and you know, now the the and it's sad that this is what it, the equivalent is in my civilian career is like if I fly down to Mexico or Canada is not too bad because they're they're usually first of all, they're super polite, which is awesome. Uh, <laughs> so they're always there to help you. But, you know, you go down to Mexico and sometimes the accent is tough or they're speaking on a frequency where half the time they're speaking in Spanish and half the time they're speaking in English. And you're like, Wait. OK, so your your brain is working kind of overload. Um, and we would see that working with foreign nations as well. And even in some regards when we would do joint exercises with the Air Force, which is funny. So that shows the difference in how we do things. 
to where, you know, I did a flight. I have a, a video that I probably should post where my my skipper and I took off in Hornets and we intercepted an F-15 and dogfighted the F-15. And it was really fun. But I listened to the raw footage of it and there's comms and you could see that the skipper was the lead and, and he would have to ask two or three times because he didn't understand what the eagle was saying. You know, even though he could understand the words, he didn't understand what it, what it meant from an Air Force standpoint. So it, it does it. Mm -hmm. Every time on the radio that you do that, it's just time that you're not used to that tempo. You know, when you would you'd fly so much, you know, and I mean, in, in aviation, as you know, they call it kind of chair flying. Right. You sit down and you think about your flight and you walk through it. You see um, air show pilots do it all the time. Sometimes they go as far as to actually walking through yeah. their maneuvers. Um, race car drivers do it. It's It's a very useful tool as much as in flight school i thought it was kind of cheesy but it is very useful because you visualize what you're going to do and then now if you take this you know monkey wrench and throw it in there of like well now i can't understand the other pilot or i understand every third thing he says or she says it's like oh my god you know so it just it throws the whole tempo off and it can be very challenging for sure so sometimes it's easier just to tell them to stop talking <laughs> yeah i can imagine but Good from, uh, you know, the E2 point from your stand uh, point is because you had a fair few crew on. So if you didn't understand it, surely someone would take over. Whereas when you're in the Hornet, you were a single kind of uh, pilot. To some degree, yeah. Um, I mean, the the one thing when I transitioned to the Hornet, I, I specifically wanted to fly the Charlie. That I think we've talked about this because it was yeah. the legacy Hornet, um, but also because it was single seat. So everything was on me, right? I would either be successful or a failure based on me. Uh, and sometimes I would do both in one flight. So based on the mission. But what's interesting about the E2 is you would assume, yeah, that there's a lot of redundancies, but there's really not. Um, there's mm -hmm. five air crew. There's three people in the back that are doing, I would say, 99% of the actual mission, to be honest with you. Uh, the pilots are up front. Now, they have integrated the pilots a little bit more, and they were doing that when I was mm -hmm. flying it. Um, but it was always as a secondary. The pilots were always the primary was flying the plane um, and making sure the mission profile was set and watching the fuel and watching the systems and all that. Um, so we would do a little bit with the back, but not a ton. So now you have three people and I'm pretty sure I can't say how many radios, but suffice to say, there's not three radios in that plane. There's plenty. Mm -hmm. I mean, the panel was about that big of radios that I could switch through. And so most of the time, each individual in the back was listening to different radios, controlling on different radios and kind of working by themselves. And then there'd be a little bit of bleed over where they would pick up on it, but not nearly as much as you would think. So they were very much, that's why the, I, my hat is off as much as I, I give them a hard time because that's just the community. Okay. The work they did in the back, there is, um, for everything that I've accomplished in my life um, and that I'm proud of, there is no way I could have done that job. I, I just know it. There's no way I could have done it from, a situational awareness standpoint and there's no way i could have done it from just an just a comfort and air sickness standpoint to be in that tube sitting sideways when the plane's going that way and you're controlling this it, it amazes me so it really does the communication aspect is huge um and the things they could do were amazing so a, a, a highly trained e2 nfo my hat is off to them they're fantastic uh and lethal as well now just like anything else while they're doing that training, they could really be a detriment as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting in that aspect. Yeah. But once they get it and they just like pilots, once they get it and they can do it, I mean, Oh, hats off. They're amazing at their jobs for sure. You'll never live that down now. You'll, you will get, I know, for that. <laughs> I know, I know that's okay. That's okay. It's okay. I, I'll own it. I appreciate them. So absolutely. So was there a, a phrase, a term, uh, whatever you want to call it so that you did not want to hear in the cockpit? And I was like, uh oh, <laughs> and, well, the the polite way to say it, and this isn't even a, anything uh, necessarily acronym wise. But I mean, throughout my whole career um, and we probably wouldn't say it this politely, but, you know, the if ever you were flying with somebody and they were like, oh, shoot, like that was never like I mean, from day one of pilot training all the way up to civilian career. I mean, I was uh, I was flying with my airline as an early first officer coming into Detroit and the captain's like, Oh shoot. And I'm like, uh, you want to expand on what's going on? You know, cause he saw something that I didn't see. Yeah. Um, so you never want to hear that. Um, because your brain goes into hyperload of just like what's wrong, you know, which is good because I think that as pilots, especially, um, once you're past all the training aspects, that's where you're really at your best. 
So you can literally, you know, you it, it's amazing your situational awareness, especially when you're comfortable with a plane at that moment where you could just be like, I, I could see things that I normally wouldn't see. Uh, it's almost superhero like in a weird way. But then again, your brain's like, what do I have to do? What are we doing? What systems have I lost? You know, and it, maybe that's just being an abused child from the Navy where we flew <laughs> things built by the lowest bidder all the time. And not that Grumman and, and uh, you know, the, the planes weren't they were great planes. But I mean, we used them hard. So things broke. But that's probably the worst. Um, and then the other thing is not hearing anything. Mm. So silence is probably the worst thing in aviation, too. And, and even to this day, I'll be flying you know, across the country and like all of a sudden the radio will get quiet and I'm like, did we miss radio frequency? Like, are we, are we talking about it? Like what they'll do is you'll, you'll just key the mic just to see if you could still hear the mic key. Yeah. And then usually somebody will talk and you're like, oh, okay. You know, so silent, you know, it's funny. The extremes of both ends are the worst in aviation. You know, it's like somewhere in the middle, just like life is kind of the best place to be for sure. So a double whammy be silence and then, oh shoot. <laughs> you don't want it's that. never good that's <laughs> never good that's going to be a rough day so that is, yeah. sure. so obviously coming out from the military what was it like you know being on simi streets uh, almost having to get back to normal and not using these acronyms and you know initialisms and stuff like that was that difficult extremely and it still is mm. um i mean i've been uh, i retired officially last year but i've been off active duty since 2014 and it's tough because in in the world we're in now, whether I'm teaching or flying or whatever for for you know the airline, is you don't know the or you do know the background, but you you could have a very different background yeah, than uh, the person next to you. And again, you you just fall back to what you're you know it's that law of primacy. You fall back to that, and I'll start talking, and they're like. What? You could see it. Now, that's the advantage is if you're next yeah. to them, you could see it. And you're like, oh, shoot, that's not let me explain, you know, and and, uh, and and the same goes the other way. If I fly with somebody that's a pure civilian background, you know, the the path they took to get to that that flight deck is completely different. And there's things where I'm like, wait, what? What does that mean? You know, they'll start talking regional airlines. And in my brain in the U.S., there's like a thousand regional airlines because it seems like everyone has a different name. Yeah. And I'm like. How is there so many? And they're like, oh, well, this one bought this one and then they bought this one. And I'm like, I can't keep up. So it's it. But it's it's really a basic level of communication um, to where you you read the whole individual, you know, and, and and you're looking at their face. And if it's not making sense, you're like, oh, that's on me. OK, let me back up and explain. Yeah. So it's still it's it is tough for sure. And um, and in every relationship, you know, you get married and even in the military and you come home, and you talk to your wife and she's like. I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm like, you will one day you will. And she, now she's hilarious. She knows it better than I do on some things. She's That's like, brilliant. well, he's talking about this. And I'm like, you still remember that? She's like, no. so it's just yeah. a different, different world for sure. So when you get with your, you know, military buddies, uh, do you talk like that still? Or is it like, Oh yeah. Yeah, you do. It all comes back. You know, it's just, it's like being on a, a, a sports team or something, you know, being in the locker room. It's just, you fall back to it because it's a comfort zone. Every, you know, everybody understands it. Um, and it's just, it's nonstop. And it's, you know, it's funny. You'll go to parties and it's probably why at parties, all the wives migrate to one area and all the, you know, the, the, <laughs> yeah, they're like, I don't want to hear this because it's just nonstop rambling of like, but, uh, well, there I was. Oh, yeah. You got to shoot the watch and all sorts of stuff. And it's all sorts of things. That you're just like, oh, God, you know, but it's it's your memories. And it's, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, in the in the States, the joke was, you know, the, the old TV show Married with Children, where Al Bundy talks about playing high school football and all that. And that's basically what it is. You just relive your glory days where you're just like, well, there I I was a fighter pilot and the coolest thing in the world. And, you know, sometimes I'll joke uh, if I'm flying with a first officer who had a military background or a fighter background, you know, if we're just sitting there and it's super boring in cruise, like I'll just look over and I'll be like, hey, you want to you want to know something? And he's like, what's that? I'm like, you used to be a fighter pilot. And he's like, <laughs> oh. I'm like, I know. Right. Like, so it's just it's but it's a joke. You know, I mean, obviously course, your yeah. role your role in an airliner is extremely important with the amount of people on it and yeah. their lives. But it's just funny because the tempo is different. You know, it's, we didn't care back then. If I flew it into the ground, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was thinking about the mission. Whereas now it's like, how much longer do we have to, to yeah. get to the, or, you know, it's just a different, different pacing, but it's both are equally important. Uh, obviously probably more so in a lot of aspects, uh, what I do now, but 
just because of the lives at stake and things like that. But it's, it's fun. It's fun to go back and, and just kind of relive those glory days for sure. Absolutely. You know, a fascinating insight there because, yeah, I generally thought um, that there would be a course, you know, like, you know, you have to pass this, know what this is, but it's just like learning on the job, which is probably some people, I think it's probably better just getting in the deep end. You know, you probably learn better. You, you sink or swim. That's it. You don't have a choice. So in your brain, I think, when it's immersed in that, just picks up on it very quickly because it doesn't have a choice. So um, kind of like, you know, they say children, if you try to teach them a new language when they're really young, they pick up on it because their brain is just really good at, at, at picking up on those things and developing because it's still in that oh. phase. Well, in aviation at the beginning, you are in a developmental phase. You know, a lot of us, when we get older, you got to kind of knock the nust, dust off your brain to get it into that development yeah. stage. But, you know, it, once once, you know, all the synopses are firing and everything's going, it's absorbing all this stuff so mm -hmm. quickly that it's I mean, you know, and again, we learn by screwing up a lot <laughs> and that Absolutely. helps. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, cheers for uh, sharing that one, Bax. But you, can Absolutely. you tell us what you're up to at the moment? Because you have an exciting project at the moment and you've got one coming up very soon. So talk us through that. Yeah, thanks. So um, a couple things going on. Uh, the latest thing that's out right now is um, I got uh, together with a, a buddy of mine who flew, flew CODs, the, the C2 in the Navy, and he's out now. And he runs a, an online I guess I wouldn't even say it's a it's a merchandise company is what it is. And it's really cool stuff. I, I was I found I saw it. It was one of those things on you know Instagram where you're just kind of scrolling, you yeah. know, and you're like, what's this? And it was a, a shirt that had an E2 Hawkeye on it. And I'm like, nobody makes shirts with the E2 on it. Like so that obviously I go down the rabbit hole of that. And um, he makes all these really funny and cool shirts and things like that. Logistics jungle on Instagram. Hilarious. And um, so I reached out to him. And uh, we came up with a shirt collaboration for for my whole never down, never out, which anybody that follows me on Instagram knows that that's, you know, kind of more of a way of life. And, you know, I said, hey, I want to do a shirt. I think it'd be really cool, but I don't want to get into shirt manufacturing. I don't want to have to have boxes of sizes and all that. And he's like, oh, no, I can take care of all that. I go, well, here's the other part is I don't want to make any money off of it. And he's like, I'm listening. And I go, look, there's plenty of things out there. You know, I'm not a, a merchandise guy. I'm an author, you know, and a pilot. Um, I go, I'd really like to get back. And so we came up with the idea to make a shirt that's, you know, my logo, my motto, all that. He sells it on his site and any profits that come off of it, he obviously gets his money for the shirt design and for the, the materials. But anything past that, which is the majority of the cost of the shirt after he told me, goes directly to um, the VAW VRC uh, Memorial Fund, which is a fund that was set up to basically provide scholarships to the children of fallen servicemen and women that flew in the E2 and C2 communities. So um, the shirt came out. I have it here if you want to see it. This is the design. The cool thing about it is that uh, – see if I can get it on camera here. It's the logo. He designed it. Right. So it's got the yeah. never down, never out with a cool Hawkeye on there. Um, and uh, the cool part about his website is any color you want, whether you want men's, women's, uh, children. He has that because, you know, I have a four year old. So I was like, I was like, dude, we got to do a children's shirt or else my, my son's not going <laughs> to let me live it down. He has a sweatshirt. I'm pretty sure my wife's walking around the house with my sweatshirt on, which is funny. Um, but, uh, you know, 100 percent of the profits go directly to this fund. And uh, really? it's really cool because um, one of the pivotal points in my life was when um, and I wrote an article on my website about it was um, when Greyhawk 620 crashed in 2000. I believe it was 2008. Um, one of my friends from my Hawkeye squadron from the Wallbangers was in the back mm -hmm. and nobody made it out. Um, well, the instructor pilot was also one of my instructors when I went through. Well, currently they're 100% funding his daughter to go through college, which is, I mean, wow. to be able to give back to that is is just really awesome. I mean, it, when I found that out yesterday, uh, I got chills. I got emotional from it. I'm like, that's amazing. You know, yeah. I go, I told my wife, I go, if you told me in, in 2007, 2008, that one day I would have, you know, any of this stuff to where I could give back and all that, I would have thought you were crazy. And, and she's like, no, you wouldn't have. And I'm like, yeah, I probably would have. So uh, it's just it's it's really been different. Yeah. So that's that project. Um, there's links to it on my website, uh, Instagram, all that um, that you can just go through and click on it. And, and like I said, that shirt, 100 percent of the profits go directly to them, which is which is really cool. Um, 
And then the other project, which is coming up that I'm excited about, um, book number two is coming out. So I don't have the exact release date yet. I think it'll either be late March, early April. That's what I'm looking at right now, just because I want it to be perfect before it gets out there. So That's I've cool. seen people rush the the publications, and I, I probably rushed a few things um, when I did the first book, too. So I've learned, although it feels like that was forever ago. Um, so it'll come out. Um, it's it's a I wouldn't go pure sequel, but it is a continuation of the story. I think people will like it. Uh, I, I think it's much better than the first. So if you like the first one, I hope you love the second one. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to have a cover reveal, uh, potentially as early as today. And I'll let you know, uh, online, but it's going to be a contest. So what you're going to get when you enter, uh, it'll be about two weeks long is you're going to, whoever wins is going to get a full, full deal of everything that I have. So the first book signed stickers, patches, coins, shirts, you know, whatever that's my normal pack, the bottle breacher, everything will go. Um, in addition to that, um, wake for warriors, which is one of the other nonprofit organizations that I support has donated some, some swag, which will be pretty cool. Um, and, um, and I'm waiting on one other company who's going to donate a little bit because they're mentioned in the book. And, and I think that'll be an interesting twist. I don't want to give away too much. And then, uh, there's even a friend of mine. She's, uh, she does wine sales and she donated a $50 gift certificate that you could go on her website and buy wine. So oh, nice. there's something for everybody. Um, yeah. but it's, and then the cover reveal will come out. Um, I'm hoping mid February. And then once that comes out, you'll be able to pre-order the book and all that. Um, and it'll initially roll out in, um, you know, all formats, ebook, hardback, hardcover, paperback with the audio book coming a little later. Cause Mike Dawson's going to record that as well. Like he did on the first one. And that just takes, a little bit of time uh, for that because I want to give him the time, but mm -hmm. I think he he did such a good job on the first one that to me it's it's worth it for sure. So yeah, so that's that's everything that's going on. <laughs> it's busy. Keep him busy. Keep him busy. That's for sure. Yeah, yes. And uh, yes. I'll click uh, in the description below. I'll link all the stuff to the competition, the books and everything, and the dates for the competition. And you can head over to Wombat's website, Instagram, Twitter. I'm sure you probably already follow him. But uh, yeah, Wombat, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure and a bit of an insight absolutely. as well. So that's uh, been perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. I know it's it's challenging with the schedules, but I really like being on here and it's fun and it's cool to just reach out. So we need to do a, a live Q&A or something again. That was, oh, that was fun yeah. to do. I enjoy yeah, that. I <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, cheers, man.